Welcome to the second of two Frankie Visiting Fellow Lectures, our opportunity to share with the larger Yale community work in progress by Alejandra Oliva. Before I introduce Alejandra, I'd like to say a few words about Richard Frankie, whose generosity has brought Alejandra to Yale this year and who died last Friday. Rich's contributions to the Whitney Humanities Center and its programs have and will continue to lift our spirits and nourish our minds. He provided both the inspiration and the endowments for the Frankie Lectures and Seminars in the Humanities, the Frankie Program in Science and Humanities, and the Frankie Visiting Fellows Program. Since 2005, the Frankie Visiting Fellows have served as catalysts for intellectual gatherings at the Whitney Humanities Center, setting their own agendas and presenting their work to the community. Their presence ensures ongoing interdisciplinary exchange and creative debate at the Whitney in particular and at Yale in general. Frankie Visiting Fellows are an integral part of the Whitney Fellowship and this year I've been especially grateful uh, to James McCauley and Alejandra Oliva for their supportive presence in our Wednesday Whitney's Humanities Center Fellows Forums. One final word about Rich Frankie. His New York Times obituary in yesterday's paper suggests donations to a cause that was dear to him, support for immigrants and refugees, <coughs> specifically Integrated Refugee and Immigration Services in New Haven, IRIS. Thinking of Rich Frankie today, it brings me great pleasure to be introducing someone whose life work centers on immigration and who does that work in Chicago, the city where the Frankies made their home for most of their lives. I'm delighted then to introduce Alejandra Oliva. Since she's come to the Whitney, Alejandra has completed the manuscript of her much anticipated book, Rivermouth, which her publisher has described beautifully as, quote, an urgent reckoning and reexamination of the humanitarian crisis we call the American immigration system, based on her work as a translator for asylum seekers. Her experiences with borders and asylum um, include her time following a migrant caravan and helping families cross over from Tijuana into California, which she described in an award-winning essay, At the Border, No One Can Know Your Name. She can also testify to her work as an interviewer at an immigrant detention center attached to a private prison in the state of Mississippi. Alejandra brings to all her work her unique talents as a poet, an essayist, a translator, a textile artist, a theorist of social justice, and language justice. Her trajectory is as intentional and creative as, an art, as her artwork. After an undergraduate degree at Columbia, she began working with the New Sanctuary Coalition as a volunteer interpreter and translator in asylum clinics. She took a master's degree at the Harvard Divinity School where she honed her thinking about social justice, reading Oscar Romero and Valeria Luiselli, among others. The day we discussed the poster for her talk, I learned something precious from her about writing. She chose to illustrate this lecture, and you can see the poster over there, with a work of embroidery she created at the very worst moment of the lockdown. Growing beans in her apartment, sitting in for a long haul, she decided to sew individual beans in a pattern onto the center of a cloth. And if you look very closely at the photograph, you can see the threads push through the beans with a needle, an arduous process. She surrounded the beans with stitched fans inspired by the work of one of her favorite Mexican textile artists, Gabriela Martinez Ortiz two textures, two substances in harmony. I learned that there's a link for Alejandra between putting words on a page and stitching. Both involve minute attention, repeated gestures. Both are born of a mind clearing away distractions and paying attention to detail. Strength of imagination goes hand in hand for Alejandra Oliva with strength of purpose in the public sphere. 
She has worked since 2019 as the communications coordinator for the National Immigrant Justice Center in Chicago, which provides direct services, state and national advocacy, and information to media who are covering exceptionally troubled and troubling immigration policy. We're honored at the Whitney to have given her space to write about this important work. Her lecture is entitled, You Can't Translate What You Can't See Between Languages in the U.S. Immigration System. Please join me in welcoming Alejandra. Thank you so, so much, Alice, for that incredibly lovely introduction. And thank you so much to the Whitney Humanities Center and Mr. and Mrs. Richard Frankie for giving me this incredible gift of time and resources to work on my book. I was so sorry to hear of the passing of Mr. Frankie. May his memory and his legacy be a blessing. Thank you also to all of you that are here today, particularly my family and my friends who have traveled to be here. I'm incredibly excited to be with you this afternoon and to talk to you a little bit about what I've been working on during my time here. As Alice mentioned, I'm a translator. I have translated for people who are filling out asylum applications in the basement of a church, at the US-Mexico border in Tijuana for people who are waiting to cross, for the lucky few who have emerged on the other side of harrowing legal journeys who want to tell a journalist about what happened to them. I've observed translation happening over Language Line, a telephonic translation service in immigration courtrooms in Boston for people appearing in court over video link. I've witnessed the effects of a lack of language support for immigrants incarcerated at a prison owned by Core Civic in a small town in Mississippi. I've also done translation in the ways that many of you have experienced it, behind a computer screen with a beloved or complicated or exciting text open in one window, a Word document in another. Today I want to talk about both of these kinds of translation and the way that they sit next to each other and influence each other. I think it's also important to note that I haven't really gotten any, translating, any training as a translator or an interpreter, nor am I really an academic. I'd like to think that I've done a fair amount of reading in the field of translation studies and that my near daily practice of translation and interpretation have really helped me sort through what I've read, define and embrace what feels true. But I also know that I'm not really engaged with the ways in which the academic community has been thinking and talking about translation. Because of that, I'm not sure how or whether my project really speaks to more contemporary conversations about translation and translation theory, but I'm really looking forward to your feedback and questions at the end of the talk. When you're translating, you're constrained by what you can see on the page. If you miss the way that two words flow sibilantly into one another, or you don't know the meaning of an aphorism, then they don't turn up in the version of the text you create as you translate, or if they do, it's a lucky accident. A sentence carefully crafted for the way it sounds read aloud falls flat, the sky literally begins to rain cats and dogs. This kind of mistake is invisible to most readers, who will never read both the original and the translation, who probably don't know enough of the source language to clock a sloppily translated axiom. However, this is also the kind of mistake that might keep you up at night as a translator. What injustice did you do to the original? What nuances in the text does your audience have no hope of grasping because you missed it? Something similar happens with the kind of writing I do. My work sits somewhere between journalism and memoir. It's largely based on my own experiences, but it's bolstered by research, by going out into the field, by meeting people, by talking to people. This is, to some extent, translating the real world into language. I can't really write something I haven't seen or lived through. I've tried, I'm not that good at it. Um, but I also can't transmit the entirety of reality to you on the page because I can't see it all. Things by necessity will slip through the cracks. The possibility for this kind of misreading or blindness also keeps me up at night. Am I doing the stories I tell justice? Am I missing the context that you then will also miss? The stories we tell ourselves, the stories we receive culturally also work as blinders giving us quick mental shortcuts to a misconception or letting us take the way out of the story that makes us feel the least bad. We prefer to gloss over complexity in preference of a simple story, easy to tell and understand and respond to. These stories are the equivalent of a word-for-word -word translation. They help you get a general shape down on paper, but they're, otherwise they're oddly constructed and ungainly, they're easily misunderstood, and they fall apart under any kind of closer scrutiny. So much of our current immigration system, the stories in the media, the laws that are written, are meant to be like these word-for-word -word translations. They supply us with the easy stories, the bad hombres, the children in cages, and through them are erased legions of other stories. 
thousands of other contexts and individual lives are papered over or omitted from the record in favor of the easy story. It is not hard to be moved to emotion and action by these stories, to anger, to grief or fear, to protest, but it's just as important to keep paying attention even as the big stories run out, even as the narratives unspool into a gray area. The very existence of the immigration laws we have today is proof of this. Our asylum laws specifically were created to respond to a single story, and for narratives outside of that, the aid we can offer is hamstrung by the laws we're governed by. Our concept of asylum on an international level is based on ideas about religious and ethnic persecution that began during the Holocaust and are narrowly crafted to prevent another genocide and just that. During the Second World War, national immigration quotas based themselves on a story about other nations overrunning the United States with floods of immigrants, kept the MS St. Louis floating off the coast of the United States, full of German Jewish refugees who couldn't claim a formal kind of immigration assistance. Even as the ship floated close enough to the shore for the passengers to hear the music from Miami nightclubs, even as Americans argued that those on board should be admitted to the US, our laws made no space for the passengers of Saint, the St. Louis to be granted entry into the United States. The St. Louis eventually turned around and docked again in Europe, resulting in the murder of a quarter of its passengers in Nazi death camps. In response to that great horror, we have expanded our story about immigration once, and we need to expand it again today. To gain asylum, you have to convince the United States government that you have a credible fear of returning to your home country because you are or have been persecuted by your government or an entity it is unwilling or unable to stop, and that this persecution happened because you are a member of a particular social group, a characteristic of yourself that you are unable or should not be forced to change, your political opinion, your religion, your sexuality, your ethnicity, your race, your gender. Our immigration laws and the story that has inspired them since the 50s keep us from helping the man from Haiti who is legitimately afraid of returning home because of rising sea levels and a lack of local infrastructure. The United Nations has predicted that by 2050, between 25 million and a billion people worldwide will be climate refugees displaced by droughts, floods, fires, and rising seas. Our immigration laws force us to treat the man with a possession charge who has been in the United States his whole life differently than the man with a possession charge who arrived when he was a year old. Both get a few months, a couple years in prison, but at the end of that time, we tell one of them that he has paid his debt to society and is able to go home, while the other is incarcerated for even longer, separated from his family and community, and ultimately is sent to a strange country he barely knows. Today's immigration laws ask us to pretend that border cities are safe places for people waiting to enter the country, even as the State Department issues travel advisories warning US citizens to stay away, ask us to ignore violence against people unless it happens under deeply specific circumstances, ask us to formulaically and easily refuse help to those who, were we to actually listen to their stories, we would extend a hand to. What I'm getting at is this. You make a personal ethics, you make laws, the same way you translate a text, the same way you write a book. You look at the world around you and there are things you notice and there are things you don't. There's the short version of the story that you're able to receive and a thousand longer ones you don't. There's the short, sorry. If you're lucky, you read the words of other people who have looked out on the world before you, who have caught other things that you didn't and you change your mind, you change your actions, you start seeing things you had been blind to before. There are many things that, because of the family, the place in society that I was born into, I had the luxury of learning slowly, of learning only intellectually and never emotionally until someone who had learned them the hard way was kind enough to show me. There are other things, other experiences that I know people to be blind to that I felt down to my bones. The thing I've been writing and thinking about for the last five years and more concretely in the last few months here at Yale is yes, immigration, yes, translation, but it's also reading and rereading, going over passages in your life, pouring over someone else's words until you find your own life irrevocably altered. Today, I want to talk to you about the way this happened in my own life. It starts with translation, and it starts with the two languages I was raised in. What can I tell you about growing up in two languages? What can I tell you about the way that Spanish folded me into my family, the house I grew up in? What can I tell you about how English gave me access to the world outside my house, allowed me to have a different vocabulary to talk about who I am? Most of my life is conducted in English. That's the language I use to think, read, write, argue, calculate tips, chat, swear, name myself. 
But still, whenever I hear Spanish on the street, especially a strong Mexican Spanish, a feeling of tenderness of family springs up inside me. This, more than anything, means family to me. Even though so much of my life happens in another language, this well of feeling that Spanish uncovers means that my life, lived only in English, would be incomplete. Growing up, we never really lived anywhere with big communities of Mexican families, or if there were, we weren't really part of them. My Spanish was not the Spanish of backyard barbecues or entire weekends spent together with a herd of other children my age, or the Spanish of telling secrets under the covers at late night sleepovers. It was the Spanish of deep inside jokes of my parents' 1980s slang, all cleaned up for us. The Spanish of Guadalupe Pineda and Cricri. -cri. Translation was a way, the only way, in which Spanish became social. It allowed me to reach beyond the boundaries of my family. I marked the beginning of my work as a translator to January of 2017, the first week of the Trump administration. Like a lot of other people, I had found myself at odds with everything that week, strange and restless and anxious. And so when a friend offered me the opportunity to translate for asylum seekers at a weekly pro se clinic, I said yes immediately. This is how I found myself sitting in a church basement just off Washington Square Park with a couple of other volunteers across the table from a woman who has only been in the United States for about three weeks. Let's call her Myra. I'm not actually going to be telling you the real names or stories of anyone that I've talked to. Uh, because that's their stories and not mine, but also not giving you a name or a face to the people that I've met is one of the reasons that it's so easy to discard the stories we hear. So for now, for this talk, Myra exists. She has a name. She's a real person I spent an afternoon with. Her story is not dissimilar to those of many people I've worked with, and she's sitting across the table from me a week after Trump took office. Between us was an I-589 form known as the Application for Asylum and Withholding of Removal, and it would be our job together over the next few hours to fill out that form and petition the government so that she could stay in the United States. The question of where Myra will be allowed to call home is so critical because the answer is a matter of life or death. Back in Honduras, where she had lived her whole life up until a few weeks ago, her brother was shot in front of her, and the guy who did it told her that she would be next. The asylum application is her best shot at convincing the US government that her survival is dependent on her being able to stay in the country. Even though we're here around this table, ready to fill out this application together, all of us wish we did not have to be. Myra, I'm sure, wishes that this translation we were working on was unnecessary. She would rather her life had continued on its familiar way, her brother alive, her family together in Honduras. I, and I assume the other volunteers here with us, wish that Myra's presence in this country was not, to some extent, contingent on the strength of my translation, on the tear jerkiness or trauma of Myra's story. The US government, based on this form, appears to wish Myra was not here at all. And yet, here we all are, Myra, all of us, volunteers, and the US government, collaborators on this translation that no one really wants. My job sitting across the table from Myra is to let her talk, to ask clarifying questions, and see if, through the interview, new information can be shaken loose, placed in a chronological order to form a cohesive narrative with cause and effect. My job is also to take her words and carry them across, from the Spanish she has spoken her entire life, into English, the language spoken by most people in the United States, and critically, the language spoken by the government officials at the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services that will read and judge her application. I'm particularly well-suited to the task, if not uniquely so. I've spoken both English and Spanish my entire life, my childhood echoing with parental admonishments to repeat what I'm saying in Espanol. Mm -hmm. Spanish was a language for home, for family, for affection and love and closeness, and English was the language of the outside world, of many of the books I read, of school. Growing up in a relatively wealthy family as the US citizen daughter of Mexican immigrants, I was given my languages in the same way I was given my citizenships, as a birthrights, motherlands, and mother tongues at once. In my interactions with people that were working towards both Americanness and English, I came to see the outlines of both as artificial. In contexts where everything was being done to divide me politically from the people I was speaking to, it was our shared language that allowed us to find shared ground. It was in doing the work, the translation, and the interpretation, but most importantly, the listening, that my world shifted. The political, moral, emotional category that encompassed me and my family and the people I loved grew and expanded not just in name or in ideals, but in actual fact. Translation for asylum seekers was the thing that finished transforming my tongue into a political actor, finished bridging the divide between the Spanish inside my head and the Spanish in the rest of the world. Spanish, the language of my family, allowed me to feel my way into a kind of intimacy with people I knew very little about, allowed me to be useful in a way I didn't know how to imagine. 
It allowed me to take a thing, a language, a vocabulary, a way of speaking that was the province of my safe childhood and to try to extend it like a protective mantle over the people who wanted the same for their own children. The translation with Myra was the first time I was really able to do that, but it also immediately became clear that our conversation would not be productive protective. It would not be a matter of safety or care or love. If you're not familiar with the I-589 form an asylum seeker must fill out, the bulk of the form consists in detailing whatever traumatic event has sent someone fleeing from their country and answering why they believe that event came looking for them specifically. As each of the form's awful stilted questions land, I watch as Myra shrinks farther and farther back in her chair, her eyes more often seeking out the corners of the room, her sleeve in danger of being picked apart. I offer tissues even though she's dry-eyed, water even though her voice doesn't crack, a break even though when I ask, she looks at me with a grim set to her jaw, shakes her head no, and so we keep going. As I talk to her, I'm also talking to the two other volunteers around the table with us, explaining to them in my own voice, in my own words, what Myra is telling me, so that they, and they are writing it down. So the ways in which I'm hurting Myra by asking her to remember, do not go to waste. I take her words and I translate them. I carry across. Into, I carry them across into the language of her new country. Translation comes from the Latin, translatus, to carry across. The word itself implies an edge, a dividing line. To translate means to carry across languages, across borders, across cultures. Translation is also something we do with our bodies, something that lives in our blood. We move through our mother tongue into that of a new home. We sense the right word or phrase with the kind of bodily intuition where shades of meaning and imprecise logic dwell. In his book, Translator's Turn, Douglas Robinson posits a theory of translation that is visceral, that involves gut feelings and clammy palms, sense residing, not in cognition, but in sensation. I have found this to be true. Our bodies remember the specific word, flavor of words in two languages, the taste of the edge between two ways of saying. As the word implies, we also use our bodies to carry meaning from one language to another. It's impossible not to feel what I'm translating inside my body, impossible not to carry it with me from a church basement or a plaza after I hang up the phone, damp and hot from being pressed next to my ear for an hour. So much of translation and interpretation requires me to pass someone else's language through the first person. Their eye becomes my own. Their injuries and experiences enter a language that, for all that I'm trying to render faithfully as theirs, is in reality only mine. This line of self and not self is like chalk on a blackboard. From far away, the line looks crisp, stark, easy to understand. But as you approach it, as your nose bumps the dusty slate, you understand that the line is not exactly unbroken, that no matter how much you erase, the particles of the chalk that were that line still float through the air. When you translate, it becomes clear that to be entangled with someone's language is to be entangled in them, in their histories and idiosyncrasies. To translate is to be in community with someone. This is in part because language is something we construct together across countries and continents and centuries as much as within communities and conversations. There is no expression, no understanding without the other to express or to understand. When I speak Spanish, I'm speaking the language of Hernán Cortés and La Malintzin, Sor Juana and Gioconda Belli, Cervantes and Marqués. It's also my own language, the words taught to me by my mother when I was just learning to ask for what I wanted, the made-up language composed of malapropisms of mine and my siblings as we were learning to talk. The borrowed words from English, the patterns of sentences I unknowingly absorbed from my parents' ways of speaking and made my own. This language is the water I stand in, the well I draw from. There are tributaries feeding my spot in the river, both above and below the earth. This same river, a little further upstream, is the one the 17th century poet nun, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, drew from. And when I say the word mujer or the word fe, these are words that have been fundamentally altered by her having written about them some 300 years ago. The Spanish she wrote, in turn, was influenced by her time in the viceroy's court as a lady-in-waiting, as it was by the Nahuatl she learned from her mother's household staff as a child. As influenced by the Spanish of Hernán Cortés, who had first come to Mexico just 129 years before her birth, as by the language of Malintzin, the Nahua woman who served as his interpreter and the mother of one of his children. This was the water Sor Juana drew from, and what she returned to the river was forever altered by having passed through her hands. When I speak or write, my words flow out from my own little eddy to rejoin the wider stream. My turns of phrase become part of the Spanish that exists in the world, just as Sor Juanas did, able to be picked up and passed around, drawn up to drink from, and to be appropriated by another waiter. In this way, language is made up of the personal and the cumulative, each of us standing in our own space, absorbing the words around us and contributing to the greater stream. Like the waters of the river, it's an inevitable, inseparable commingling of the collective and the individual. 
Language would not work if we could not share it, but the individual impressions we leave and the baggage we bring with us on each word we say matter too. We should also talk a little bit about the baggage that translation in and of itself brings, particularly here in the West. A lot of the earliest questions in translation studies are ultimately biblical translation theory. This is why even when you're not necessarily talking about the word of God, the original is held up as this bright inviolable light that the translator must struggle to approach, much less replicate. To find the source of this brightness, theorists keep pointing not just behind the original text, but behind language itself. Walter Benjamin, who was deeply concerned with the idea of God's language in his essay, The Task of the Translator, describes a good translation as one that is transparent so that it, quote, does not cover up the original, does not block its light, but allows the pure language to shine upon the original all the more. He gestures not only at the pure language of Babel and the Bible, but to the threshold space that translation occupies, the way it needs to both exist and not. There's a sense in which looking at any original in the light of divine origination makes total sense. The creation of any text is a miracle of individuation, of reference and self-reference, of idiosyncratic experiences, just as miraculous of, as the idea of an individual consciousness. When you're translating literary texts, there's a kind of slow awareness of this as you find your sentences unfurling along paths that are not your usual, a different understanding of the creator of the text. When you translate, you become aware that this author, your author, uses the word cuerpo, the word casa, the word tierra, like no one ever has or will again. You also realize that you can only ever know a part of it. You can only skim the surface of their meaning. The dizzying individuality of any single writer or mind, multiplied by all the possible writers and minds, or even your own as you read or translate, unfolds into a world that feels as intricate as God's fingerprint. My investment in this idea, however, stops short when I think of my other source texts, which are not usually the product of slow mornings sitting at your desk, or even the stress and pressure of looming deadlines, but rather the product of extreme violence and fear, created not to serve a creative desire, but rather to fill a bureaucrat's form. I don't like the implication that there's something holy about suffering that's present in so much of Christian philosophy and often gets carried over into translation theory. I hate the idea that there's a pure and shining light at the back of any of the pain I've borne witness to. None of it feels like what I want God to be. I don't want to honor the original, don't want to revere it like I might the words from God's mouth. On the other hand, I also don't want to mutilate the stories I'm given like I do every time I fill out an asylum application. It feels sacrilegious to cut up someone's life in the interest of the government because there's something of value in someone's story something that deserves careful treatment, deserves to be honored and respected and not prized out with priors and smashed up. This something isn't about the divinity or the foreordination of any story or the sacredness of the idea of stories in general or about the beauty of suffering, but because the people telling them are viscerally embodiedly human. As I'm reminded with every tissue or glass of water, these stories are important because the person sitting in front of me and I share the fragility of our flesh and are entrusted to one another because of the thinness of our skins, the delicate workings of our insides. At the same time, our bodies are not enough. The asylum application is a skeleton that, like the worst B-movie cliche, longs for a body. The asylum system is hungry for bodies, bodies to suffer, bodies to fill up beds in for-profit detention centers, bodies to work in the fields and factories and behind the scenes of everything, all the while rejecting their humanity. The I-589 pretends to care about biography, asks for a narrative in a specific person's voice, but in reality is only concerned with the violence on the body, glancing off anything deeper than the skin. A bad translation does the same work. It lives on the surface of the text. It's concerned with the physical shape, the surface meaning, whatever mo reflection momentarily blinds you. A good translation drives somewhere to the beating heart of a text. You can only translate what you can see, and if all that is visible to you is a body, if all that is presented is the surface, then there's something about the human that's still invisible to you, to the government, to the immigration judge in his chambers, and the CBP patrolman in his truck. The people I translate for are survivors among generations of desaparecidos, the farmers with land not yet seized or made barren by multinational corporations, the people who are not left to die in the desert or dumped into mass graves in the sea, or corralled into camps to die of neglect, the campesino no one bothered to bribe. The United States has been deeply involved in Central and South America for decades. Behind every revolution, every uprising and coup of the 20th century, there were CIA agents or congressmen making colonial decisions to stop the spread of communism, or more commonly, to protect US investments and corporations. The translation I take part in is the meagerest form of reparations and has more to do with the CIA agents and the congressmen than the utopian promise that more contemporary translators make for us. 
Like the United States, which welcomed European immigrants as low-level workers with a plea for the world's tired and hungry, which bills itself as a great melting pot with fine words about the equality of all men, Translation likes to describe itself as a diplomat, bridging cultures, or as a bridge itself, spanning the Rio Grande, the kind of thing that can transcend borders. But ignoring the ways that power can thrum through and across that bridge, the way a diplomat always, always has his own nation's best interests at heart, you become complicit in this power. When I translate for an asylum seeker like Myra, I like to think I'm working against the powers that be. But the truth is, I'm filling out the form. I'm making people findable, searchable, cross-indexable for a government that has proven time and time again that the only way in which it cares about these lives is, it re is as resources to be extracted to exhaustion. I don't know how else to help. I don't know if I'm brave or smart or strong enough to find another way to wipe away the fear of separation, the fear of return, to remake the world into the place it needs to be to make sure everyone is safe. I don't even know if bravery or smarts or strength on an individual or an even collective level are capable of fixing this problem. Instead, what I have is this government form and a little while to spend across the table from Myra and the ability to make her feel heard, even if I know this application might not be enough. Years later, when I started working more closely with actual immigration attorneys rather than just volunteers, I found out that they actually call the I-589 on its own a skeleton application, just the bare bones. When a lawyer actually helps someone apply for asylum, something that happens in less than four in 10 people applying from outside the detention center and for even fewer people applying from inside, the skeleton is in flesh. It, you add affidavits, expert witness testimonies, reports from forensic pathologies who are able to examine clients' living bodies, fat files of reporting on what's called country conditions. A fully completed asylum application usually runs be somewhere between 300 and 500 pages, solid bricks of paperwork that are stacked up high like a defensive wall when someone goes into court. We in the Pro Se Clinic were turning in the 12 flimsy pages of the application alone. This in itself was a strategy. It allowed Myra to have an application in prior to the one year filing deadline. It gave her extra time to find an attorney, to find another means of protection, to ensure that she's at least got that pending asylum application, that paperwork in, as a mean for safeguarding against deportation for the years it will take for that application to wind through the system. The text that I end up producing for that form is by necessity skeletal. It's a bone shard in the desert. The boxes provided for answers to the questions asked by the I-589 are small, and the attorneys who review our files don't recommend using the overflow space provided. So we're restricted to 150 words per answer, clipped and factual, describing the things that have left a mark on a single body, but never what it is like to live inside that body. Asylum translation is less like building a bridge and more like the translation of saintly relics. When a saint is canonized, they are brought up out of their resting place, usually somewhere where they lived and grew up and did their holy works and instead brought to a place that is the center of power. When Constantinople, for example, became the center of the Christian world, a flock of holy bones was translated there from the surrounding areas. This legitimated the holiness of the tibia of St. Leocadia, the forest full of splinters of the Holy Cross, the skull of St. Cordula. But it also gave holiness and legitimacy to the church in Constantinople, marking it as holy for being able to gather holiness to itself. When saints' bones enter a church, they're gilded and boxed up, removed from their context of a grave of a living person somewhere in a community, and instead recontextualized and presented alongside the calcified hagiographies as proof of the church's power. You don't know, actually, who St. Leocadia or St. Cordula are, or who they were, or what they did, or how they died. All you know are their bones, their holiness, their presence proof that the church is worth dying for. The translation of bones serves the church and not the stories of those interred. The US government is not the Catholic Church, but it does require asylum seekers to be saints. It gathers their stories to itself, forces them to be translated in language and in fact, given that they don't accept anything other than paper files, something which has continued to be true through the pandemic, uh, mailed into their headquarters, into their own language and space, literally. The power here only moves in one direction and everything done by asylum seekers, every translation done by them and their allies serves only the reader the United States government. The text, the presentation of it, the imprisonment of it within the form's boxes, away from the messiness of a real life and into the beats of a known and understood hagiography, a quiet and virtuous life shattered by a single act of explicitly politically motivated violence, an escape by night, a plea for safety. These are meant not at all as an expression of the person telling the story and entirely to satisfy the entity processing it. 
if I do my job right, if in those 150 words I tr succeed as a translator, what the asylum seeker I'm working with gets is a grudging acceptance of their humanity, a big official rubber stamp that says that their suffering matters, but not much else does about the ways in which they have stayed alive or lived at all, just the suffering. A lawyer I worked with at the clinic called it bureaucratic violence, the carrying across of people out of their own words, their own language, the mutilation of the stories they tell, a violence I participated in, even if it was as gentle as I could make it. There was, however, one other way in which the translation I was doing was skeletal. When you're doing literary translation, again, it's common to talk about the ways that you're subsumed, enveloped, given over to the shape of someone else's language. A literary translation project involves making yourself porous to the text, allowing it into you, and allowing yourself into it. All reading, all interactions really involve this kind of cross-pollination, but translation also asks and answers a different question. When you're translating, you're giving over room in your brain, days of your one single life, to the careful, minute study of someone else's work in order that others might have the privilege of encountering it. You're not only recognizing that your voice isn't the only, the most important one, but you're sinking precious hours into that belief. There's also a return, though. In making yourself porous, you also make yourself expansive. You're allowed to reach beyond yourself. This is both different and not when I'm translating for asylum seekers. Even as I'm translating their stories, I'm passing every word they say through my own first person, feeling an echo of what they're telling me in my own self. Their stories are often ones of violence against their bodies, stories that pass through me as they pass through language. I can catalog on my own body the places where people have shown me their scars, turning me into a mirror. Cigarette burns on the back of a carefully manicured hand. The aftermath of a surgery that was itself the aftermath of a stabbing, someone's chest and the softness of their belly crisscrossed with ropes of scar and the punctums of stitches on either side. Old, old bullet scars cleanly through both ankles. An unset broken leg and the weight on my shoulder of the man who used me as a crutch for a short walk. I don't know in my body what it's like to be hurt in these ways, but I carry a record with me anyway because it's impossible not to. It's very much on vogue right now to talk about secondhand trauma, something common among social workers and EMTs and anyone else whose job involves stepping into the worst day in people's lives, as a shadow of knowledge that wraps around you when you have come to know, through observation, the depths of cruelty that exist in the world. Secondhand trauma is complex. It works in many of the same ways that firsthand trauma does. Your brain gets rewired in the same ways. Your physiological responses are the same to it. However, secondhand trauma also carries the shame of safety. You're aware that you live removed from the suffering itself, that your reactions are outsized for someone who basically has just heard about the pain, that you're protected even if your physiological responses don't recognize that. Why should I find myself crying on the train rides back home? Why does someone's story linger with me, take up, up space in my brain night after night? Nothing had, after all, really happened to me. Here's where secondhand trauma does differ from first, though. I give it time, just a little, a matter of weeks or months, and the howling rage stops, the winds die down. It gets quiet enough for me to work, to put words to the things that I saw and felt, to find the way to bring other people into what I'm feeling. When I translate, I try to make myself invisible. In a sense, I don't exist. When I take up the weight of someone else's story by translating it, the thing I carry is a ghost, and the teller is no lighter for the mere fact of me carrying the story alongside them. It's in feeling the weight of the story that I can transmit it to you also, which is why I try, and why I try to erase myself in the process so that you might read someone's words that I have translated and be reminded of your mother or your aunt or your sister, your neighbors and friends, forgetting the step in the middle. I aim to become invisible because then this asylum seeker is speaking directly to you and you have no choice but to listen. When I'm writing though, working on this book or on a press release or a client profile for my day job, for this speech, this is when I have a different goal. You, for better or worse, recognize me as one of your own. We share experiences, a language, a way of reading or thinking about the world that means that I've been invited here to work and give a talk at Yale. But I've also, however briefly and not experientially had my foot in another world, which is the world that I'm here to translate for you. This trauma translation, my weaker ghost version of the original thing that I witnessed, I'm hoping it works like a real translation. In the same way that translating a text brings it to a new audience, I want my work to bring a reality that was previously invisible and illegible to light. I'm hoping it builds a bridge to greater understanding, or rather, a bridge across the gaps when you realize that, like me, you understand so very little of anything. I hope it's clear that what I'm giving you is not, cannot actually be the real thing. 
I couldn't even hold the real thing myself. I felt it slip through my fingers as I tried. It's far from Walter Benjamin's ideal of an invisible translator, but I'm doing the only thing I can. I'm making myself visible. I'm taking your hand and walking you through it, pointing out the places where I've left things out or omitted details, critiquing my own translating as we go. I can't go back to the person I was before that church basement in New York, before Tijuana, before the Boston courtroom or the prison along the Mississippi. I can't unbecome my parents' daughter. I can't unlearn Spanish or teach my, unteach myself English. And so I'm left to return to these things and places over and over, to draw strength from them to see the world more clearly, to think of them not as the facts of a biography, but as tools with which to dismantle walls, tools with which to fling open the doors and beckon people in. Thank you. I'm wondering, you know, you've worked on a lot of different kinds of translation. Are there kinds of translation that you haven't worked on that you would really like to explore or oh things gosh. sort of on your radar that, you know, maybe you've worked on privately that you hope to maybe bring to your professional side? I, I know that you have a lot of different directions for translation <laughs> that you work on. Yeah, um, I have done a fair amount of literary translation kind of on my own, but haven't had a ton published. I do have a book with Fordham University Press that I got to collaborate with uh, Rachel Buff, who is an immigration historian at the University of Milwaukee. And the book is called A is for Asylum Seeker. And it's actually a bilingual edition, which is really great. But um, beyond that, I haven't really gotten to do a ton of literary translation that's been like published and edited and that I've really got to like be forced to bring all the way to completion. And so I, that's something that I really would like to do more of. Um, thank you so much for that. That was a really beautiful and very thank stimulating you. talk. Um, I realize um, some members of the audience may be more versed in all of this literature than, than I am, but I was just curious if you could explain a little bit more the connection you describe between um, kind of modern translation theory and literature and Christian conceptions of suffering and the connection between those two and uh, I, I found that fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of times when you are looking at really early um, translation theory, like a lot of the really like St. Jerome, who was the first guy to translate the Bible into Latin in its entirety, um, you're really seeing a lot of things that are struggling with like how can we take this this text that we recognize as being completely divine, completely inviolable, and then translate it. Like, is that not removing it from its sanctity? Is it not like carrying it away from that? In a lot of the same ways that we talk about translations as being like less correct versions of the original text or sort of adulterated versions. Uh, there's a quote I think from Cervantes who describes a translation is the back of a, a back of an embroidery, actually, and like showing all the seams and the ugly sides. Um, and so, when you are sort of referring to the original in this like inviolable light, because it's divine, because it's perfect, even when you're talking about something other than a than a scriptural text, you're still sort of giving it this this authority and this this divinity that. It gets really complicated and gets really muddy when what you're talking about is someone's account of suffering that was sort of extracted from them unwillingly in order so that they might fill out this form. And I think that Christian scripture especially is really, there's a lot of emphasis on suffering in particular being pure and being divine and being one of the ways that we attain holiness, like just through like the Christ story alone is a pretty clear example of that. Um, and so when you kind of lay those things together, things get really, really muddy if you're looking at this suffering as holy when we should really be regarding it as anything but. Is this on? <laughs> um, I wondered whether the words that you just shared with us, uh, your speech today, is in the book that's coming out. Yeah. Because I want to share it with some other interpreters that I know. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it's separate or in the book. Um, it's in the book, but I was kind of copying and pasting a lot from different sections of the book. There's some things in here that don't appear in the book. Like, the book is, 
it's a Venn diagram that's very closely overlapped, but there's still some stuff outside of it. But um, I think this is going to be on YouTube later, so. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. Thank you. Uh, you cited earlier um, Walter Benjamin's The Task of the Translator, and, and one of his core arguments in that text is that it's not just merely that the translator's role is to translate um, a work from a language A to language B, but mm -hmm. that that act of translation, in fact, changes both those languages and the work itself. Yeah. Um, and I actually, I'm a student at the law school and I recently had the opportunity to do intake interviews for asylum seekers. And so I'm curious kind of, uh, having kind of gone through that translation process myself in a smaller form, what is your process of translation as well as navigating your ethical obligations as a translator when you're trying to take what these, tra what these um, clients of yours are trying to share with you, and as you translate that and and change it into a uh, in a separate language, and as well into the box that you set, you know, the box that basically the U.S. government wants you to be mm -hmm. able to fit their narrative in, and also trying and create a compelling narrative for the government. Yeah. So this was something that I really struggled with, and I still really struggle with as I'm in my day job. I still I. I'm the communications coordinator for the National Migrant Justice Center. I end up interviewing a lot of people, and while they get to tell somewhat expanded stories of and about themselves for things like the media and stuff, there's still always sensitivities around the case that we want to be like, okay, I know this feels important for you, but you cannot share this in a wider venue in case it impacts your case, or people are going to read this in a different way than what you are wanting to share about yourself. And then it's it's also really hard to like actually get someone's like full informed consent to do the kind of like translation and storytelling that you're doing because you're like, this is what I need from you. This is what the US government needs from you. And I know that like what feels important to you about your story is maybe not the same things as what this other entity feels is important. And so the best answer, the best workaround I've found is to just read back, like retranslate whatever I've come up with back into Spanish for them and be like, okay, here's what I have for you. I know it's not going to say the whole thing. I know it's not how you would tell your story because I've heard you tell your story and this is not how you tell it, but I'm going to give you back what I've done and like, tell me if there's something that you want to change, keeping in mind that we have all of these bullet points that we need to sort of hit in order to make this the strongest case that we can for you. And so it's just about like talking back and forth as much as possible and being like, here's what I'm hearing from you. Here's what I need to share with the government. Here's what the government is going to know about you eventually or what this journalist is going to know or what we can share with this journalist and what would be better if we don't talk to you about them or whatever is going on. Yeah, I want to continue on that because as you were speaking, there was this incredible suspense you created in your talk and I was imagining the form in my mind. I mean, I could see the paper and I was imagining how in the world, you know, how Miriam's story came out. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking about narrative and about restraint and the kind of restraint you have to use. I mean, you've answered it a little, but I guess what I wonder is, say in your book, are you going to include some of those forms? Oh, that's a good question. I don't currently have any in there right now. I do have some of the conversations that I was describing of like, okay, I'm going to read you your story back or like, let's have this conversation about what's going on and like there are also all different kinds of ways that people like respond to having to tell this story like mm -hmm. i've sat there with people who are just telling joke after joke after joke oh, of like horrifying things that are happening to them mm -hmm. i've heard of people yeah. who like just stare down at their hands like do a monotone like i'm going to get this all out it's going to come out once and that's it no mm -hmm. questions we're done here uh I've had people who cry through the whole thing. Like there's just such a variety of, of ways that people encounter this questioning that again, you're like, I want to be able to take this and like show the government, like this person is 
so altered by having passed through this and like their storytelling is so altered by having gone through this experience and there's just no way to get that across. And some people end up eventually getting to go to court and having their hearing and being able to testify on their own behalf, but that's pretty rare. Yeah, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking that there's no room for storytelling and yet you need to move somebody. Somebody on the other end is yeah. reading and being moved yeah. or reading between the lines. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this story with us. I am wondering um, where your relationship ends with each of these clients. Does it stop after they fill out this form or do you continue to help them through their process and get updates on whether their application was approved or not? Um, that really depends on like what, what I'm working on them with. So like when I was working at the Pro Se Clinic, it was very much like, you have your paperwork, go file it. Like we were not attorneys, we were not really qualified to help them through any of the other stages of the process. And so every once in a while, someone would come back and be like, this happened, or like, this is going on. I do have a lot more contact with the folks that I work with now at the National Immigrant Justice Center because I do work with a lot of attorneys who, like there have been times, I actually got to, there's an AP story about this that I did the translation for, but we had a client named Alex who had been in detention for a really, really long time. Uh, he was a gay man and he had been, like the, board, the guards there were just kind of pushing him around and being really mean to him. And he, I said that they were gonna let him go and they didn't. And uh, like there was all this like push pull going on with that and then there got to a point where he was like, I'm done, I wanna to talk to a reporter, let's get this set up. And so I was able to like work on interpreting through that with him. And then like a couple months ago actually, he got out and you know, got reunited with his boyfriend. He's like living very happily. And so like, it's very occasionally that I get to like hear the end point of someone's story. But like, especially now that I'm working with a legal aid organization, very often they are good endings to stories and that, that's really, really nice. <laughs> I think we're set. Oh, Haley's um, coming back. So I know that the book that you're working on right now is, is coming out, and I'm curious in terms of how much of that includes sort of your experience with immigration versus translation theory versus, and you touched on some of the sort of like Christianity roots of, of translation and sort of how do, you, how do you balance what, you know, how much you include of, of those pieces? Um, by having a very good editor. <laughs> um, I gotta say that a lot of my early drafts are like pretty heavily lopsided in one direction or another and they're like, okay, hold on, you have to bring this other thread back or, you have to talk about this a little more. I also know that I know a lot about this stuff, but sometimes forget that other people don't. And so I've also, I am lucky enough to work with a really fantastic agent who was like, I don't know what this means. You need to explain, you know, what a credible fear interview is a little better or something like that. And so I've been really, really lucky to work with other people who have been fantastic readers and asking me like good questions to make sure that everything's well balanced, because that's not always my first impulse. <laughs> well, we wish you just huge success with thank this you. important book, and thank you again for sharing your story and the story of your clients. Thank you so much.